Welcome everybody to Paleo Talks. We are on episode 27 this week and we have Dr. Jeff Martin with us today and he's going to be talking with us about bison. And uh, bison is something that uh, many of us share in common with some of our background and research. Uh, definitely Chris Widga who's done a ton with bison and he's getting all of his questions ready today. Uh, and Jeff, we'll, we'll circle back into you in just a minute, but how about a big howdy from you? <laughs> Hello, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> He's up in South Dakota now, and we'll come back to that in just a second. But uh, David Moscato is our science communicator, another one of our past students, works with us here in the Center of Excellence in Paleontology, and he's going to go over uh, some of the guidelines of how this works. Go ahead, David. Absolutely. This is the standard Paleo Talks format these days. We're going to start with discussion with our guest and then go into the main presentation all about bison, which I'm excited to hear about. Always fun to hear Jeff talk about bison. Jeff's very excited about it. And then about, you know, half an hour into it, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. And that's going to be the whole rest of the program is answering questions. So when that time comes, we'll make the announcement. We'll remind you to ask questions. So go ahead uh, when that time is around, leave your questions in the Facebook comments. We'll read them from there. And if you can't for any reason leave comments on Facebook, you can head over to the Gray Fossil site on Twitter or Instagram, and uh, I'll be keeping an eye there uh, and collecting questions from all the different sources. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, and I'm Blaine Schubert. I'm the director here of the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University. Uh, we oversee the Gray Fossil site and a, a big paleontology program and Museum of Natural History. Uh, so hope you all get out here to visit when this COVID is all over with, and we'll keep coming to you uh, with these talks until you get tired of us, I think. Uh, again, I want to introduce Chris Widga, who's down here and in his garage, which has now been remodeled into his office, it looks like. <laughs> and uh, introduce Jeff Martin. Uh, Jeff came to us quite a while back as an undergraduate, actually. Did his undergraduate at ETSU, or finished his undergraduate, I should say, at ETSU, and then went on and did his master's and then headed to Texas A&M to work on his PhD. And as I understand, he has been back in South Dakota for, for just a couple of days, or at least back in his position over there for a couple of days. And Jeff is basically synonymous with bison. And um, we'll let Jeff tell us more about his bison journey. And one of the things I like to start out with, Jeff, is, is just tell us more about who you are and your background. You know, we already know this here, but tell everybody about your background in paleontology and what eventually led you down the track of studying bison and include your graduate degrees as well. Sure, yeah, uh, happy to. Um, so I uh, will back up a little bit beyond schooling. We'll start with uh, School of Hard Knocks. Uh, I grew up on a bison ranch. Um, and so I am familiar with the animal. Um, for the last 20 years, growing them as meat animals, as breeding animals, uh, making them available um, uh, to various sources that way. And my, um, from a young age, I was always interested in geology. And so I thought it'd be really fun to go get my degree in geology and get away from the ranch a little bit. Um, but every step along the way, bison kept pulling me back. Uh, I'd have uh, undergraduate research projects first at South Dakota School of Mines and Technology here in Rapid City, where I am now. Um, and then I transferred to East Tennessee State and I continued to work on bison, uh, rolled into my master's program. Um, with the master's project, I was looking at the nativity of bison on the Colorado Plateau, especially in and around the Grand Canyon region. Um, and now there's a new federal policy that has been changed because of the research that I worked on um, with Jim Mead, um, with Blaine, and then uh, Wally was also on my um, committee, Stephen Wallace. Um, and then from there, yeah, I moved to uh, Texas A&M University and I moved away from paleo and geology a little bit more towards the living into wildlife um, and, and fishery sciences, uh, emphasis on the wildlife not so much on the fisheries. Um, and there I focused a lot on using the fossil record and we'll go into that here in the talk, um, but then try to make it applicable to conservation today. So I'm a blend between 
wildlife conservation and conservation paleontology. That's kind of where I, I lie today. It's so exciting to see how many people with paleontology degrees right now are coming out with new methods and interdisciplinary ways of connecting the past and the present. You know, we used to, we used to talk about it a lot, um, but in recent years, we're really getting to see the application of this with new tools. All right, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and show us your first slide and start working into the, the show here. All right, it should be working now. Can you see it? Yep. Great. And so, yeah, I have, um, as of two days ago, or sorry, this is my second day at my brand new job. I am a postdoctoral researcher um, for the Center of Excellence for Bison Studies. So this is now the second center of excellence that I'm a part of, uh, first one at Paleo. And Center of Excellence for Bison Studies is absolutely brand new. Uh, it was just announced about a month ago, and it's with the South Dakota State University. It's housed uh, in Rapid City at the West River Research and Extension Center. So uh, the premise is to continue to work on bison research for myself um, as part of the center, but then also the center is going to help facilitate additional research beyond South Dakota. So we're gonna try and coordinate all of these different bison researches that are happening in Canada, uh, the U.S., even over in Europe, if we can, eventually, um, build these collaborations and continue to work on bison. And so the premise that I'm going to present on today is how climate change is affecting bison body size. And so I'd like to start with uh, acknowledging the primary funders of the research that I did um, here, especially Texas A&M University and AgriLife Research in Texas A&M along with the Boone and Crockett Club, the Explorers Club, and Western Bison Association. Without their support, this research really would not be possible. So thank you to all of them, especially if you're listening to this talk. And with that, I guess we'll get going. Maybe. There we go. And so the rise and fall of bison body size, or why are bison smaller from north to south and through geologic time? And so We'll break this into two parts. Um, we'll go over a brief description of what it means to be a bison in North America. Um, what is the problem that I've been trying to observe and, and measure? And we'll attack that through the fossil record, looking at body size. And then we'll also look at thermal imagery as a driver of body size. And so what does it mean to be a bison in North America? Well, the North American bison, bison bison, um, has been here um, in some form or another for the last 160,000 years. It came to us from Eurasia over the uh, Beringian uh, land bridge. And in Beringia, specifically in, in uh, Eastern Asia, Eurasia, uh, we had bison priscus occupying um, that area. And then eventually, as they came across the Bering landmass, Changed into this, um, what we conventionally call bison lascensis, a slightly larger version. So this gray line is trying to mark the same size across. And then bison latifrons, as they finally spilled down into the southern US, were a huge animal. Um, and then through time, as we get closer to today, they got small. So we have this rise and fall of body size. So, Jeff, if you could leave that picture up for just a second. Good thing. As we're looking at these and seeing these, you know, the question that many paleontologists and, and zooarchaeologists have talked about is, you know, as we classify these things, can we really divide them into different species? Or is that something that we're not so certain about anymore? And maybe you're going to talk some about this, but while we're looking at this image, can you give us a little bit of a hint, or a little bit of a talk about sort of current knowledge on are these different species and, and what supports that if it does? Right, yeah, that's an excellent question. And so classically uh, in, in paleo, um, let's say the late 1800s going up into the, all the way up into the 60s and 70s even, a lot of the taxonomy for bison uh, was established based on horns, horn cores that were preserved. And there is vast um, diversity uh, within those horn cores that were preserved. but through the years, as we continue to sample and find more and more and more of these samples, um, there are thousands, tens of thousands 
um, of, of fossil specimens for bison. And they no longer really cluster so much because we have such a good sampling and they're actually more of a gradient. Um, postcranially, they seem to be identical. They're just different in size for the most part. The ratios are all uh, very, very similar and can't be uh, parsed out. Uh, the teeth, uh, what you usually use for other speciation, you really don't have that big of a difference either. And what about genetic work? Yeah, and so more recently, since about 2004, uh, a instrumental paper by Dr. Beth Shapiro um, was looking at the paleogenomics, paleogenetics of bison, and trying to classify based on the genetic material preserved if these are indeed different species, pretty much from latifrons to today. Um, there's few, there are fewer samples available for Priscus and Alaskansis, but it's really difficult to even find differences in the genetic material. Um, and so it seems to be that these multiple lines of evidence are, are, are piling up and saying that they probably aren't that different of a species and probably somebody, I'm pointing at Chris now, uh, needs to revise all of this taxonomy huh. at some point. Or perhaps we need to get a whole group together and really look at this together and have, bring in all of these lines of evidence. Because there's not a point in time, is there, when we get clear morphological differences of two different species living side by side living when it comes to bison? Side. So, you know, where you're, where you're basically you're able to say at the same temporal moment, we have this morphology and this morphology representing two different species. Instead, it seems to be this gradational change over time. Yeah, and so there was a paper that came out, oh, I think it was 2012 or maybe even more 2016 uh, by Sue Breer or Sue Breer. I apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciation of this <laughs> last name, but there's a large group that was looking at uh, Eurasian bison, and they did seem to have two morphological distinctions. But the way that they found that was actually in the cave art, that the cave art that was being drawn by uh, the early peoples was actually, they were early taxonomists. They were seeing differences. And then they do have a genetic component to these two different lineages living at the same time in the same place, but that's over in Eurasia. We don't have that over here in North America. Um, so that was, a, that was a fascinating study that came out. Um, and I think it made huge waves uh, throughout the scientific and public realm um, for that information. All right, thank uh, you, Jeff. don't have that here. All right, go ahead. Okay, and so, um, yeah, so I, I wanted to talk about the collapse um, that happened about a century ago. And so probably in the 1870s, 1860s, there's anywhere between 30 and 60 million bison roaming North America. Um, this is a traditional map um, drawn out by William T. Hornaday, um, showing where he thought that bison were pretty much uh, limited to in the se late 1700s and 1800s. And then going into the 1870s, we have this darker circles that have been cut off here by the Transcontinental Railway. So we had a northern herd and a southern herd. And then by pretty much 1880, 1882, these dark black circles were the populations that were left. So less than a thousand animals in all. Uh, today, the conservation of bison has brought them back to nearly half a million. Uh, so it's taken a century to rebuild um, less than a thousand to half a million. And that's large part to the contributions by conservation herds and private herds. Um, here's the conservation herds uh, that we know of. Um, this is probably outdated, needs to be updated a little bit more. Um, and then these are the private uh, operations that have bison. Um, usually for production. One of those dots is probably my parents. And so getting back to this rise and fall, um, I want to take a deeper look at this fossil record to see, can we measure what's going on? Before that, oh, sorry. <laughs> and one other additional premise to make things complicated is over space, bison are also different sizes, not just through time. So absolutely today, Bison in Canada and the northern U.S. are larger than bison in the southern U.S. Uh, this has been described um, as of 1847 by Bergman. And his premise was that animals near the equator, so latitudinally, they are smaller. 
he didn't give a temperature uh, driver. He didn't give a latitudinal driver um, at that point. Remember, this is the 1840s. And so I wanted to test this really historical ecological uh, rule. And so uh, in 2018, uh, my study came out called bison body size climate change. Um, and the question here is, does temperature affect bison over long time scales? These are the samples uh, that I used. And in large part, these are sampled by uh, Chris Whitney joining us today. And also Matt E. Hill and Matt G. Hill is uh, compadres from Iowa as well. Um, and then I've added just a few sites to it. Um, and these are really well constrained uh, temporally. And we know exactly where they came from spatially. And what I was looking at, and what we need to tie to is what's happening at the global scale, because we're going to span the last 40,000 years. So I turned to the Greenland ice sheet to give a northern hemisphere record of temperature change. Uh, so using their ice, uh, <clears throat> isotope of oxygen, we have these cold and warm um, cycles that go through time over the last 40,000 years. Here at the blue arrow is the last glacial maximum, or is the one of the coldest, most recent for us. And then we have a younger dry where it got quite a bit warmer, pulling the aller rod where it dipped cold again before it got warm in today's Holocene. And here we are today uh, on the far right. It's much warmer. And so to give you an idea of what's going on, six degrees colder at, at um, Celsius globally is what produces ice sheets that cover all of Canada and the northern US. Um, again, that's down here close to 25,000 years ago and negative six. So if we warm up to today, oh, sorry, these little stars, keep an eye on where those ecosystems go. This is going to be the short grass, um, short grass prairies and a tall grass prairie. That's where we find these eco regions today. So when you remove that ice, these ecosystems expand. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of those simple individual steps, but that's the premise here. So we have this opening up of Alaska into the southern US. And so what I want to do now is make cold up and hot down. So we're inverting it um, from top to bottom. That's all we did here. And what we see is, oh shoot, I got myself out of order here. All right, so what we need to do now is go measure the fossils. Uh, this is the calcanium to heel bone. Uh, so it's positioned here in the animal and this is the bone isolated and the element here in a, um, proximal view and a lateral view. So what we're mostly interested in is the lever length of the calcaneum here, right? And if you want to do a gear ratio, you take the difference between this uh, lever and the full uh, length. But we're only going to be interested in this um, distal tuber length. Bison have already been worked up to have, be have, <clears throat> to have the relationship built for the measurement of that uh, distal tuber length here in the X all the way up to what it means to be body mass. So we have small on the left and large on the right. And numbers don't mean much and the pictures don't mean much. So I have 3D printed the two um, samples. This is the small one. This is the large one. That is what the difference in those alkenia are. Um, so you can get that kind of a bit of a thought as you think about these different sizes. And where, where are they from, Jeff? Oh, good question. Yep, the big one is from uh, La Brea, Tar Pits, and it's dated about 22-ish thousand years old. We can go back to that here in a little bit. And then the little one is from Glen Rock, uh, Wyoming, um, and it's a modern Holocene site. Um, it's at a smaller end of the spectrum. About 600 years old, if, I, if my memory serves. Um, and so we have 60 sites, about 1,200 specimens. And what that means is we have small bison to big bison, which matches the small calcane to big calcane. So when we place these on um, graphs together, we have uh, bison out here at La Brea, all the way through here. So this is the big guy. You're at almost 25,000 um, in pretty cold temperatures. Remember, cold is up now. And then we go through time to towards today, where we have the cool down, and then a warm up. And then cool that, or sorry, warm up again. Warm is down. <laughs> Even I mess it up. Uh, what that means is if we remove time in this relationship, 
out now have a relationship of global temperature on the X and body mass on the Y. So now we can look at these different relationships uh, over a spatial, or sorry, a temporal, an environmental gradient instead of a temporal gradient. And these individual lines are showing the classic uh, species of bison. What the red line is showing is if we consider all of these to be the exact same species changing through time. And what that means is that treating them classically as individual taxon, the slopes are 41 kilos for global temperature change of mass loss. But if we assume that they are the same species, which is more likely, uh, the slope is then negative 63 kilograms per degree Celsius. So as we reach out into four degrees warmer, which is predicted, we're going to have bison that are nearly half the size that they are today. Yeah, so Jeff, this is, this is really important here. And as we move forward into the future with, with global climate change and global warming, are we going to have mini bison? You know, we can have them little pet bison. That, that I mean, 300... 57 uh, kilograms is the size of white-tailed deer in many places. <laughs> and so I, I'm almost tempted to call these pocket bison. They're so small, you can put them in the pocket. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's likely given the information that we have in front of us here. Um, the main issue that I had then was trying to identify the absolute drivers. Um, is it temperature or is it also drought? Um, as we warmed up through the Great Plains, the Great Plains dry out. This is the traditional home range for bison. And so there's a different paper that I have for that. Um, and it, it differs whether you're looking at the spatial relationship or the temporal relationship. Uh, over space, they do seem to be accustomed to their temperature a little bit better. Um, it's drought the main driver for that over space. But over time, temperature is a huge driver you looked at 50 years of records at Wing Cave National Park um, over the last 50 years. So from 1962 to 2015, 2016, somewhere like that. Um, and, and then we also compared a bunch of locations. But we can get into that a little bit later and say that the questions come up. So in summary, bison are smaller when the earth is hotter. And so that got me thinking about these drivers. And this is a conceptual diagram. Uh, looking at this again, big and small body sizes, is that if we know that a colder temperature for the Earth has bigger bison and a hotter temperature of the Earth has smaller bison, what are the potential drivers? Is it direct um, driving, so thermal regulation, how they balance their heat budget? Or is it indirectly for how the climate affects what they're eating, um, the nutrition? And so we won't have enough time to go into the nutrition today. So we'll focus on the thermal regulation uh, from here on. And so that thermal biology and growth of bison paper just came out um, a couple months ago. Um, and the general question being applied here is, does warming affect bison directly? And we set out, I set out to visit 19, operating bison herds um, throughout the Great Plains and adjacent. So I was way up in Saskatchewan, out in Western Montana, all the way into Wisconsin, Minnesota border, and uh, down into Texas and New Mexico. And so with this particular sampling, we have a, a huge gradient of, of temperature. So it's about two degrees Celsius, average mean annual temperature up in the north. And then in the south, we're running about 20 degrees uh, mean annual temperature Celsius uh, in the south. But we also get a, a precipitation gradient from west to east, from dry to moist. Um, so we can now look at these different drivers of a huge space. And what I took with me was a thermal imaging camera up here in the top left. And here's a little video that I have uh, showing heat transfer of these animals. So this was a hot summer day in South Dakota, site number seven here. And so the purples and, and, and blues um, are going to be representing cooler temperatures and the yellows and the reds are gonna be hotter temperatures. So notice the horns are quite warm and whereas her nose is quite cool. You know, most mammals have a cool nose. And this was probably about 110 degrees uh, Fahrenheit this day. Um, and then a 
cold front came blasting through and dumped a lot of hail on me. And so this cow has taken advantage of this thermal difference that was created within minutes. She's jettisoning heat out of what's called a thermal window here near the abdomen. We generate heat through metabolism as they do, but they have an additional mechanism of generating heat, their rumination uh, in their gut. And how they ruminate it just produces more heat. And so they have to get rid of that heat. And it's usually right through the closest area, which is the, the abdomen. The horns also serve as a way to cool down their brains. And we can get into that in a different discussion. But even the calf, you can see each breath that the calf takes, these nostrils will flare up with warmth. So this is a really cool piece of equipment. Um, here I have a better picture of what it was like to be out on the ferry with that camera. So I'd be set up in either a four-wheeler or a side-by-side -side, um, with my thermal camera on the tripod. And I've got this little ditty here next to me, and it's a mobile weather station. It's taking uh, measures of temperature, dew point, um, relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction, um, everything like this. The camera is taking those images um, and, and having the infrared spectrum being measured at each little pixel. It's also measuring the orientation that I'm looking. So you can see this little compass here. And this temperature in the top left is telling me what the temperature is at the exact middle of the frame. It's not really important for this. Um, but then I take this into the software and harvest all of the data from each pixel um, from all of these animals. There's about another 1,200 uh, pictures that I took for this. And another shot. Sometimes when I'd be walking out in the prairie, I would come back to my car and it would be surrounded by bison um, and I'd have to wait. <laughs> um, so I just took, made the best of it and took pictures of them while they're near my car. Um, so how much observation time did you get in? So I did this over a summer and over a winter, uh, summer of 2017. I was out for 45 days, so a month and a half. And then in the winter of 1718, I was out for, I think it was 38 days, so a little over a month. So almost three months in total, I was out on the road. I racked up 19,000 miles on that little Subaru. Uh, Had anybody even looked at any, any type of thermal imaging on bison before? Uh, thermal imaging on bison has been done before. Um, it was done when the technology was first coming out in the uh, late 90s. Here in South Dakota, as a matter of fact, um, Joel Berger uh, did some of that. But the questions that he was asking weren't anything related to thermal regulation. They were more looking at what's a good way to do photogrammetry. What's a good way to figure out the size of these animals? And the ability then of the thermal imaging is being able to see where the eyes are, because right? you can't really see the eyes brown on brown. Uh, with a regular picture, but with a the thermal, those eyes light right up. So then you can figure out what's the distance between the eyes and figure out the size of the animal from a distance, remote, uh, remotely. Um, and so this application was really new. Um, the thermal regulation part has really been built by Glenn Tattersall out of Canada, uh, looking at toucan bills and how toucans will use their big bill to jettison heat as their thermal window as opposed to bison using their abdomen. And were you seeing that larger animals retained more heat, had a more difficult time removing heat? Yeah, so, so there's two parts, there's two moving parts to that. Um, one part is the size, so I had to correct for size. Um, so every, every single picture that I took, uh, so this picture on the bottom right, this, this, this camera has a touch screen, and so I had a laser rangefinder with me, and I knew then the distance between me and that animal. And then I'd write that distance right on the touchscreen when I saved the image. And then so I'd do a calibration to figure out this is the actual real world size uh, between these points. Um, and then I would take that thermal information. So once it's corrected for size, you're able to figure out that big bison are struggling to dump heat. But the flip side of that is that they can retain heat better in winter. Um, and so that's what some of these results that we have. Um, so we have Bergman's rule that we tested at number three, but there are three other rules and hypotheses to try and test. 
um, with Koyman's daily, uh, daily dynamic energy budgets, Schmidt Nielsen's um, body surface to volume uh, ratio relationships, and Speakman and Crawl, uh, the heat dissipation and how that relates to growth. And so just very quickly, um, I don't want to bore everybody with these details, but at a daily scale, bison do um, respond to the weather that's going on around them. So red is indicating uh, images taken in summer, blue is indicating images taken in winter. Um, there's probably about just shy of 800 points represented here. Um, and really what we're trying to see is these seasonal differences with these slopes, the lines here. And so this is the environmental temperature around us. We have wet bulb globe temperature and black globe. We can go into that in a later detail if you'd like. Um, but really, the wet bulb globe temperature is the best representation of what it actually feels like. It includes wind speed, it includes relative humidity, and what it actually feels. And so we're getting nearly negative 40 um, C, uh, this is all centigrade, to nearly 40 positive. So that's a huge spectrum. And um, then we have the body surface temperature on the left. So you can see that they're jettisoning more heat. Um, but just the temperature alone isn't enough. We need to convert it to watts of energy. And so when we transfer that to watts of energy, we have an estimated body size and uh, heat transfer. And really what this is showing is that more negative is heat loss, right? So the bigger you are, the more heat you produce and you have to get rid of it. It fits over a log scale also. So the relationship of surface area volume holds true, and that's what we are expecting. Bergman's rule, which is testing uh, the idea of being able to jettison heat because you have a different body size at your latitude, it is weakly associated, and it does have a seasonal component to it where there is uh, less heat dumped in the wintertime. So they're retaining more of that heat in the wintertime. They're able to jettison that heat more efficiently at the southern end because they're smaller. So we have this slope indicating three things. We have the heat flux, how much heat they're dumping over latitude, so the south to the left. And because they're smaller at the south, they're able to get rid of that heat more efficiently, but they lose heat in the wintertime. Speakman and Crawl is looking at how does then that use of energy, um, how is that being reallocated for growth or not? And so we're looking at this total surface heat transfer again and relating it to the relative growth rate. So this is taking two points within the same curve. We have calves to two-year-olds. So we have two years of growth of a curve. We take the difference between those to get our average uh, kilograms per year. So at the high end, we're almost at 120 kilograms per year. These are colder locations, uh, turns out, as opposed to the hotter locations in the south. So there is a relationship of this allocation of energy to growth um, once we boil it down through the facts or through the evidence that we have available to us. And so all of these uh, rules are being applied at various time scales, or various spatial scales, all at the same time, continuously. And so our, our study is really predicting that bison body mass will have by year 2100 if we do stay the course for a four degree warming scenario. Um, that metapopulation means it's 665 kilos down to 357 kilos, almost half. Um, and that warming will continue to stunt growth. So what's expected in Great Plains is um, across the Great Plains, the mean and temperature of um, So we do uh, expect these growth patterns to suppress. That has some consequences uh, for production, for life history, um, for how these animals operate. Um, their productivity will decline because as you get smaller, your reproduction will shift. Specifically, if you can't keep your nutrition up to support that. Your growth will decline because you're using energy elsewhere. And um, from the, some of the data we have from Wind Cave National Park, your longevity, your lifespan also declines as you get smaller for bison. So you can't get the many, as many years of production if you're doing production or as many years of conservation if you're trying to perpetuate these animals. 
Some cows um, have been known to live until they're almost 30 or into the early 30s, producing a calf almost every year. Um, but if that drops to say 25, you've now lost a considerable percentage of calves that you could have over the long term. And I think that wraps it up for me anyway. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, David, if you wanna go ahead and jump in with any of the <clears throat> questions that are coming in. Sure thing, we've got a few questions coming in already and I'll take this opportunity to remind everybody that now we're gonna take questions from the audience. So go right ahead. Uh, if you have questions and you haven't put them in already, put them in the Facebook comments or head over to the Gray Fossil Site Twitter or Instagram page and uh, send us your questions there. I'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Uh, Chris, did you want to ask this, this first question? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. have to unmute myself. Yeah, so uh, actually, Larry, Larry Todd kind of had this, this question that I was thinking about. You know, those of us that have spent years of our lives measuring horn cores and bison bones and things like that. And so when you show this video, that first video, the thermal uh, imaging of that, that, that cow and the heat loss that is happening on those horns, that is really cool. Um, you know, does, do you think that, Larry's question is basically, you know, the, the thermal properties of horn sheets are really interesting. How do you think this might impact variation in the classic bison morphological characteristics of horn cores? You know, how much of this horn core morphology is part of the thermal regulation system? Yeah, so I think that there are two parts to it. Um, classically, we've thought of it as being a sexual selection, right? Uh, the bigger, more curvy, the more sexy, and you perpetuate those genes and you move on move forward. But it's likely that there's a large physiological component. These are nearly two ton animals, bison latifrons, the great, uh, great large bison with eight feet of horn span. So four feet of horns on either side um, and, and huge dimensions. But because their body size is so large, their quote unquote summers are still going to be warm for a two ton animal. And if you overheat, there, there are two things that you do not want to overheat as an ungulate. You don't want to overheat your brain and you don't want to overheat um, your uh, heart. Those are the two necessary components to keep living. Um, bovids generally, already dactyl really, but bovids especially, have an anatomical feature called the carotid root. Uh, Haley O'Brien out of Oklahoma has been doing a lot of work with CT scanning uh, recently um, dead uh, zoo animals, uh, when they still have the soft tissue, you can find these carotid reeds where they're, they're shunting blood. Um, instead of going through the body, back into the body from the head, they're shunting out to the horns. So they're pushing blood out that way to help dissipate this heat. And horn sheets are really great at doing that. Um, I've got other videos um, of wintertime where there's nothing, there's no heat to them at all. They've shut off the blood to their horns pretty much. But um, Jeff, you, one of the, what I would wonder there, yeah. Jeff, uh, is, you know, do they have the option or opportunity to reverse this and use it to warm up quickly? Yeah, so they are dark. Um, the I mean, because those off. horn cores are full of blood vessels. They are, yep. There's a lot of, a lot of blood out there. Um, potentially, I wouldn't throw it out. Um, I just... I didn't spend enough time at one location to get a, a large um, look at that. That would be a very interesting question to do and, and, and to visualize. And I should be able to, uh, with this technology, we'd be able to figure out which way that heat is going. Is it going in or is it going out? Um, so we can, we can look at that. Well, this makes me think about things, you know, so when you, you basically, one of the wonderful things about bison is that you have these great sample sizes. And I remember kind of trying to make sense of a data set of almost a thousand skulls and going, okay, what, what parses out? Can I put these into any sort of groups at all? And ultimately the only groups that I could actually, you know, kind of regularly parse out was latifrons with these very, very large horn, horn cores and everything else. So longhorn versus smallhorn bison. 
I wonder if this might kind of have something to do. It'd be really neat to think about this in terms of, you know, of what is Latifrons doing with their horns? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm also, also we're not getting them very far north. You know, I mean, Grand Zazula is on here, but I don't think that we have Latifrons up in the Yukon or Alaska. The furthest north I know of is here in South Dakota. Um, yeah. Um, that, that's, that's to my recollection. There may be others. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I, it's one direction I want to go. <laughs> um, cool. yeah, that's thanks. actually one of the questions we have. Uh, uh, from our audiences, Charlie asks, do we know why Latifrons' horns were so much larger? Sexual selection, predatory pressure, dot, dot, dot? Yes. <laughs> yeah, all of the above. Good answer. I think they all feed into each other, especially over different uh, scales of space and time, evolutionary history, these large climatic swings. Latifrons was living during these huge swings that were happening. Um, and so the just being able to survive those things is, is, is cool enough all up in itself. And um, more needs to be learned. <laughs> um, this is just uh, the beginning of scratching the surface, I think. Um, and so I hope to do more of this type of work. And so the thing to do probably for me would try to get my, uh, get some access to uh, water buffalo, um, and cape buffalo, things that have big horns that live near the, uh, um, equator um, and take some of these high resolution thermal imagery for those things and see how they operate. All right. Um, I have a couple of other questions. I just, I'll, I want to throw out, uh, Greg McDonald has, has uh, uh, offered uh, that there is an unpublished Latifron skull in North Dakota. Ooh, and there. Grant Zazula says no Latifrons in the North. <laughs> All right, so North Dakota it is. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Greg. Um, and then speaking of Greg, uh, I, so I have two questions here from our audience that are very similar. Greg asks, is there a difference in nutritional value between plants in short grass versus tall grass prairies? And do we see a difference in bison body size in those two different types of grassland? And then very similarly, uh, our old colleague Nate asks, uh, I'm curious if there's a relationship between size and plant resource uh, abundance or nutrition. All great questions and all data that I am working up right now <laughs> uh, to be published. Uh, there's already some out there already saying that tall grass prairie is going to have a lot more biomass. And so the trade off between short grass and tall grass with that biomass is there's a lot more wet content. Um, the dry matter of the short grass is sometimes, specifically in, if you're in the north, far more nutritious than C3s, uh, grasses, um, and, and forbs than the Southern C4s. Um, and so trying to get the nutrition that you need is always a struggle for wildlife. Um, but because bison graze so much, they're eating, the big bulls are eating about 40 pounds a day um, to ruminate and to keep pumping the nutrition that they need. So there's enough to survive. Um, at what point do we hit a threshold, whether it's drying or if it's warming, um, for those grasses to be successful enough for these bison? Don't know. Um, as it gets hotter and drier, we do know that grass will continue to defense itself. It will build silica structure in the cellular walls, and it makes it much harder for the gut microbiota of bison to break that apart. Um, so they have to, their, their gut microbiota are working harder to harvest the nutrition that they need. Um, and that will have trade-offs for being able to grow. And so we'll probably have to shift our thinking of what it means to conserve bison, preserve bison on the Southern Plains, more so than production of bison on the Southern Plains. And so that type of thinking um, is, it's on the horizon. Um, I don't have a firm answer on it yet, but it's definitely a direction I want to take. Interesting. And I actually, I just noticed that one of our students, Kelly, asked uh, a similar question. If the difference between tall grass and short grass uh, bison has impacted uh, conservation management questions, which it sounds like uh, the answer is yes, or at least it's starting to. Starting to, yeah. And so the Nature Conservancy is, is pretty, 
got a large uh, area that it represents for where bison are located, um, ranging from far west uh, shortgrass prairies all the way into, boy, I think they've got bison now in Indiana. Um, so really tall in that in that in that uh, very corridor that stretches through Illinois and Indiana, um, and in Illinois they've got herds there too. And so the management of, of those locations does differ. Um, the timing of prescribed burning to try and emulate what used to be quote unquote natural fire cycles, um, and then um, integrating how bison are grazing. So blazing and grazing uh, at different levels is really what they're trying to figure out and to do what's best for the landscape and best for the animals. Um, they're all moving. Uh, and I wanted to illustrate that body size is also a moving target. And body size is what you use to determine your stocking densities at these locations for managers, day-to-day -day operations. So keeping your eye on what your body mass is doing with these animals is a red flag for wildlife managers in general, but specifically for bison as well. All right, we've got a, uh, speaking of uh, differences in different places, Donna asks, uh, how much does fur density vary north to south? Uh, and if we know over time? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there is a study in the 80s that was looking at the differences in where the cake falls. So I don't have a great picture of it here, I don't think. Um, let's see, if that bull was turned sideways, I think it was. So, kind of see with this little ball here. You got this little, what looks like a hairier cape right behind the shoulder blade. That's typical for Northern, Central, and Southern uh, Plains bison. The woods bison in Canada actually pulled that line back behind the shoulder blade to cover up a little bit of the front rib cage. Um, and so they do shift how much area is a thermal window versus how much is insulated. Um, the hair depth, I'm not sure if that's been looked at yet. Um, I assumed it all to be the same. Um, at some point, I have to make some assumptions and keep moving. Um, but that's probably a direction that needs to be explored. So I know the surface area changes. I don't know about the depth. Got it. Good questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, ask the prerequisite Grand Boardman question, which is, uh, do you know if there are any isotopic differences that we see in these bison over time? Um, Chris Wicker can probably speak more to that. Um, I haven't looked much at the fossil uh, isotopes. I've been looking at modern isotopes. Over space, there is a difference um, with carbon and with nitrogen. Uh, carbon specifically from north to south, but nitrogen east to west. That, north, that tall grass, short grass does have a nitrogen shift uh, to date. Um, I'll let Chris take it from there. Well, actually, I'm really looking forward to seeing your patterns, Jeff, on, on your modern uh, bison, because what we have prehistorically is, is just a lot of variability. Um, and a lot of it is ecological ecologically driven rather than climate driven. Obviously we can look at oxygen or something like that and get these broad latitudinal changes, but uh, shifting grazing lands and shifting kind of uh, uh, grassland composition is, is really important to it, especially when you get up into the Northern Plains. And so, yeah, we've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, this was actually a big chunk of my PhD dissertation looking at Eastern bison uh, and their isotopic uh, kind of characteristics. But the other thing that really surprised me, we started doing strontium isotopes on them and trying to understand, well, did bison migrate? That was actually one of the key questions that we had early on. And the answer turned out to be maybe, <laughs> and probably not. Um, and so that it became kind of an anomaly. It, the question became, were the bison we were looking at an anomaly? or was this part of a broader pattern in time? And ultimately you do kind of see an amount of variability through the late Pleistocene and Holocene in bison mobility patterns that is, is, cannot be characterized as any sort of regular migratory inclinations. Um, you do get dispersal of certain age groups probably, and you get uh, 
uh, you know, they're adapting in place for sure. But in, in many cases, you know, my early work was looking at, like yours, it was looking at bison uh, during the Holocene from archeological sites. And oftentimes if I would look at the archeological material, the people were actually moving further than the bison were. So, you know, looking at the raw materials and their tools or something like that, they were coming from much further away. And this is for the most part in the Eastern Plains where you wouldn't expect people to be moving huge distances anyway. So, so yeah, that, that's kind of where that is. There's a lot of data out there, Grant, and uh, you know, I can send you some papers <laughs> if you like. <laughs> Jeff, I have a question about bison genetics, because they can crossbreed with cattle. So, you know, to what degree are the modern bison populations cattle? And what are the regulations when it comes to ranching and so forth? Yeah, so there have been quite a few studies looking at this exact question. Um, and the main origin for where that happened was a bit late um, um, 19th century, in the late 1800s, where because there was less than a thousand animals, the early conservations, the private ones especially, were really trying to just conserve any genetics that they could. They only have so many bison to go around, so they forced um, crossbreeding with some cattle. Um, a couple of them tried to make it be an enterprise, um, trying to get the, the most hardy animal, the most productive animal. And they got the worst of both species, <laughs> not the best. Um, and and what do you so, mean by that? And so what I mean by that is that bison are particularly hardy in, in, in harsh environments um, and cattle grow relatively quickly. So the idea is if you can get an animal that grows quickly, that can also survive in a harsh environment, you have a bulletproof animal for lack of a better term. Well, what they ended up with was something that's extremely ornery from the bison <laughs> and did not grow well <laughs> um, and stubborn from the cattle. Um, and so they, they just didn't perform well, uh, thankfully. And so a lot of that crossbreeding practice really has stopped um, over a century ago. Um, and from the data that I'm aware of, less than 10% uh, of, of bison today have any cattle introgression um, remaining. So most of the bison out there are still bison. Speaking of genetics, uh, Barbara asked, how close are bison genetically to musk oxen? Quite a ways, um, closer than say crocodiles, um, but they, uh, they, they, they're different families, or sorry, different um, tribes. Uh, there's the bovini and the ovobovini. So musk ox are in the ovobovines. Um, they're tangentially related, but um, bison and cattle are far more closely related. One, gotcha. one thing I'll kind of share there too is is yes they are kind of they're they're kind of distantly related yeah genetically but uh, morphologically we have a Pleistocene variety of musk oxen that the post crania is awful similar to bison so Boothurium which is this late this Pleistocene musk oxen um, you know it has long bones that are really similar in proportion and similar in look to bison, so it's often misidentified, um, even in some museums I've seen. <laughs> it's usually identified as really yeah. big bison. <laughs> yeah, and actually the yak is much more closely related to bison than to muskox even. So that yak that you think of in, in Himalayas um, and, and Mongolia, they're much more closely related to bison than, than most dogs. But uh, so, yeah, and use their theory to the shrub ox. So uh, Jeff, speaking uh, of comparisons and, and ranching and, and bison on the landscape, just give us a little bit of an idea of what the different impacts are of bison versus cattle. Um, so that is a growing um, area of research. Um, and how these different species over the long term have different impacts for how they move upon the landscape, how they utilize the landscape. And so the seminal place for this comparison is at Kanza Biological, um, uh, Biological Station, Biological Food Station. And that's near Manhattan, Kansas. And 
they have been running both bison and, 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 and beef next to each other in these um, long-term ecological relationships. So over a 15-year study, uh, there is a 10% increase of plant diversity for bison graze than where the cattle graze. Um, and so there is a plant diversity argument that you can make with this. Um, the, I don't know the numbers for production because they don't really look at productivity of meat uh, in, at that particular location, um, but there's probably going to be some trade-offs um, between that raised diversity and production. There's probably going to be some sort of trade-off there, but I, I don't have a figure for production at least. All right, Jeff, as we are nearing the end of our time and the last of our questions, uh, I, I definitely want to ask this question from Doug, which uh, in regards to when you are looking at the bison on thermal, what if one of the bison farted? Did it show up on the thermal? Um, I don't have a methane filter, but I can get one. <laughs> uh, I can get a methane filter for this camera and I can get a carbon dioxide filter for this camera, but I don't have them. They cost a lot of money. <laughs> uh, so I did not see that. Um, and it's, this doesn't measure gas. Um, gotcha. Temperature of gas. Um, I, I, that actually does bring up the interesting question of if you could get those filters, carbon dioxide uh, and methane for uh, measuring expulsions from, I guess, both ends of the bison. Yep. Is there what would lead someone to want to do that? What kind of information would that tell us? So that would really only give you the temperature of the gas. It won't give you the volume of the gas. Like that. It's going to see through that layer. It can just give you the outside plume. Mm -hmm. There's only two dimensions. You don't get the three dimensions of it. So trying to figure out how much are spelling would be much more difficult. You'd to have to have out. balloons. And so that has been done. Uh, balloons have been fitted to cattle, uh, both ends, <laughs> to figure out how much they expel. Wow, would the temperature matter at all? Is that something that would be really relevant to? The uh, temperature of the internal body, but it immediately cools down as soon as it hits uh, oxygen and nitrogen of our atmosphere. So it wouldn't give you a, a, an ideal temperature of the internal body. Gotcha. There's a whole body of, of work to be done out there on animal farts, uh, some of which I know has already been done. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we are we are just about at the end here. So Blaine, Jeff, Chris, if there's anything else you want to mention before we wrap up, now's the time. I have one more small question, so to speak. You know, no, you after you we're... <laughs> 22 parts. No, well, so, you know, this idea of, of dwarf bison or, or kind of toy or pocket bison, um, is there a minimum size? I mean, I, ultimately, I think there'd be a trade-off between, you know, what, what you're talking about with reproductive fitness and longevity and, uh, and, 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 and body size, but is there a point where we're going to reach a minimum size and then below that, we're not going to have bison anymore because historically or evolutionarily, we're we keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so, so do you have any feeling on what that minimum size might be? Uh, so, I have two speculative thoughts. <laughs> um, I don't have a threshold uh, uh, identified yet, um, and so that is something that I want to chase down. The first thought is that um, bison today are the smallest that they've ever been in their entire evolutionary history. And they keep getting smaller decade by decade. So we're in new ground every single decade. It's brand new for these bison, um, evolutionary speaking. Secondly, the smallest bovids are pretty small. They're the size of rabbits, like the dick dick and, and related small ruminants. Um, so ruminants and bovids can get pretty darn small um, I don't know that we want between goat and rabbit sized bison roaming the prairie, but uh, we may not be able to sustain anything else. <clears throat> I don't think they'll get that small. Uh, we'll, we'll have to get quite hot for that to happen. Um, but so there is a theoretical yeah. minimum. Yeah. <laughs> it's really small. <laughs> yeah, 
so dictics are what I don't know. I forget what the mass of an angora rabbit is, but they're not yeah. much. <laughs> Five kilos, maybe ten kilos. So all yeah. right, we should probably call it there, David. Sounds about right. This is the time. Thanks to everyone for submitting their questions. Um, and if you've watched through this whole thing uh, and you've enjoyed it, there's also been a lot of really fun bison chatter in the comments. So if you want to see links to more research and more discussion, you can check that out as well. And we'll try and answer those so best we can. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, right, Jeff. See, you. see you next week.